Uh, Trump offers some bright lights, but what do you do with a locomotive that's going down the hill toward the chasm and it's picking up speed at 80 miles an hour on the track? What do you do? You can't really do anything. You can't do much. So take a look around the malls. Uh, we just had notification that major retail chains have announced, I think it's close to 1,300 different stores are going to be shut down this year. 1,300 stores. Uh, we got Macy's pretty much demolished. Sears in a, you know, its current state of bankruptcy, you know, working toward the final climax. Uh, it seems like the only retailer who's doing anything right is Amazon. And now I'm starting to hear that Bezos is a target for something. I don't know, but uh, as a part owner of the Washington Post, he's getting involved a bit too much in politics. So I wouldn't be surprised if his business takes a downturn suddenly. He signed on some big contracts with the CIA to do cloud storage, and that's why you know, Amazon is favored by the government fascists. I'm going to use the word fascist frequently in this interview. I don't want to be confused with uh, you know, Franco in Spain. These are neocon fascists that cut across both party lines. Uh, we have two political parties now in the United States in reality. It's the neocon fascists versus the populists. Trump is a populist. The neocon fascists include baby Bush, uh, Obama, and probably three quarters of the Congress. Those are the fascists. Those are the ones who promote the wars, who favor the false news and CNN, and who, oh gosh, sign up for whatever war of the week we have. The United States is dedicated toward war. Okay, the economy is doing pathetically. Uh, we have car loan defaults. We now have, we're back to where we were in 2007 regarding home loan defaults. And we have student loan defaults that are at least one and a half trillion in volume overall, but not not at risk of defaulting. We have 40% of all student loan holders actually saying in polls they expect never to pay their debt and the government to forgive it. Uh, if you look at electricity demand, uh, rail freight movement, truck freight movement, port activity, income tax withholdings, Everything is in a dive. So Trump has plans, and I give him credit that he's got plans. Some of them are innovative. Uh, the, the most clever that I've seen is, uh, I don't know whether it's from browbeating or just encouraging as our friend, the vassal state of, of Japan, but he's, he's working toward Japan investing a trillion dollars in U.S. infrastructure slash industrialization. I don't really mind if Japan and China set up tens of thousands of businesses in the United States. We need to do something. I'd like to see a national initiative for 20,000 businesses a year in free trade zones and elsewhere, along with the, the Asian helping with the, I mean, it's like a return to the, the, the 19th century. Uh, where the Asians built the railroads. And there's a lot of controversy on that. I mean, I don't want to get into all that. But, you know, a lot of Chinese work toward building the railroads in the West. And, and we could have a repeat of history with uh, Asia building infrastructure again. Infrastructure is highways, port facilities, railways, bridges, tunnels, high-speed rail, uh, airport facilities, you name it, all, all the above, fiber optic connections. Uh, Korea, South Korea has the best fiber optic connect connectivity in, in the world right now. And the United States is actually not doing badly when it comes to telecommunication infrastructure. We're doing very badly with our 
uh, dedication to the Rockefeller model on uh, gasoline and diesel usage. Uh, how, how are those eight-lane highways around Los Angeles? How, how are they doing lately? They earn the name of parking lots. If you want to contrast, take a look at the major cities of China, where you have 16 different rail lines moving between cities to the suburbs and to distant locations like other cities. Every major city is extremely well organized, and they do not have a lot of truck traffic in their distribution system. They're far more advanced than the United States, and the Americans have no idea how far behind we are. So Trump has some plans. I give him credit. Let's see if he can make some progress. But let me just cite to you, Dave, the principal challenge that Trump has when it comes to um, legitimizing the dollar and working toward setting up industry again in the United States. We had 30 years of outsourcing of industry. I remember the first event was 1984. Intel announced they were going to move a lot of their fabrication plants for chip. They call them chip fab plants. And they were going to move to the Pacific Rim. And we at Digital put our heads together and said, this is a very bad trend if it becomes a trend. And it became a, a national movement. And by the 1990s, I concluded as a, you know, still working in marketing research and industry in the United States, I concluded with my own abilities that uh, the United States has moved away from legitimate income. And now we're going to rely on phony financial sector income, asset bubbles, etc., financial engineering, which, by the way, Greenspan gave his full weight and support. Then came Lehman and the bust. So it's on his hands. But we have, as a result of 30 years, a $550 billion annual trade deficit. This is the major problem for the nation when it comes to economics. We lack industry. We lack an adequate base of industry with which to carry on business as a nation. Now, remember in the 80s and 90s, the Germans did not follow our lead. Western Germany and Britain, and uh, I don't think Australia did. Western Europe and Britain and Canada largely followed our lead to destruction. They also followed our lead in the real estate bubble destruction. Australia is stuck in that right now, but they've got a very different phenomenon, kind of like Western Canada. Tremendous Japanese, I'm sorry, tremendous Chinese property demand. Okay, so let's just suppose that the several people on Trump's advisory team who are full-blown advocates of the gold standard decide, all right, let's try to work toward a gold-backed currency and, and get some basis for the currency that's precious metals and Let's go about the revitalization of our nation. Okay, well, let's assume, let's just assume that the trade deficit doesn't get worse because of a, you know, a proper policy. Let's just assume it's a nice flat $500 billion for a trade deficit. Okay, if we back the dollar with gold, then our creditor nations, I, I should say the surplus trade nations, can all group together and say, all right, we 80 nations have claims on $500 billion to your gold-backed currency. We want those 13,000 tons of gold. That's just the first year. That's assuming it doesn't get any worse. I'm hearing it's going to be closer to $600 billion this year because we haven't done anything. We never do anything. All we do is print more money and have more fraud and have more wars. We never fix anything. Hey, Jim, is, are, are the neocon fascists, are they going to stop Trump from bringing jobs back here? I mean, I mean, are they on the same page as him? I don't think they're on the same page as Trump for anything. They want to continue the wars. They actually try to promote the conclusion, the, the belief in the U.S. 
population that war is good for the economy because it brings jobs. It's the exact opposite. There's a two or threefold trickle down for military type weapons jobs. There's a seven or eight fold uh, trickle down for actual products and services. In other words, if you build things, you install things, you improve the efficiency of systems, and you create a wealth that trickles down all through the neighborhoods where the people work. If you make weapons, when you install something, you end up with massive destruction. So they try to actually say, this, I call it Reich economics, fascist economics. They try to make the point that all the war will result in tremendous job growth from the reconstruction. I mean, everything just about is upside down, Dave. It, it's really quite pathetic. But we're, we're going to get to the jobs creation stage if we can get past the political squabbling and undermine and sabotage game. We haven't done jack shit industrialization since the inauguration two months ago. We also have uh, coming up on March 15th, the, uh, the debt ceiling. Uh, how do you think Trump is going to handle this? This is when everything freezes because Obama and Boehner, they made that agreement that, you know, he can bring the debt up to 20 trillion and, you know, we'll put it out until 2017 when Obama wasn't in office. What do you think is going to happen at this point? Okay, I, I must admit uh, a little bit of ignorance. I thought that it was permanently suspended, and now it's going to be unsuspended. I did not know that Obama just m removed the debt limit during his watch. Um, I think what's going to happen is what's always happened, without exception, within the U.S. government squabbling and, uh, what's the word, deliberation. Uh, for the debt limit. They'll extend it. Uh, you may have some mini crises where a few offices are shut down and then there'll be more threats and then there'll be more white paper reports of the consequences if this continues. And then the Senate, being the irresponsible and reckless group that they are, uh, will just extend the limit. They'll maybe make it, you know, 21.62 trillion. And how will they arrive at 21.62? I don't know. They'll probably pull it out of their asses. But what they don't properly estimate is the deficit. A uh, deficit is probably $1.4 trillion last year. $1.2 trillion the year before. It's getting worse. It's not getting better. So if they just put it up by $1 trillion, we're going to revisit this point in less than one year. What will Trump do? I think Trump will say, hey, look, you must extend the limit because I've got some plans for infrastructure projects. Have we launched a single shovel on a single infrastructure project in two months? No. Have we instead made commitments for a $50 billion increase to military spending? Yes. So, you know, <clears throat> I'm in favor of the whole Trump theme, the idea of Trump. Uh, I'd like to see some actual projects kick off. I'd like to see some actual arrests, like for McCain, Pelosi, Graham, these are traitors. I'd like to see treason become a watchword with the American public demanding action for treason. I, we, we've got it all over the place. I've been saying kind of as a bad joke for the last two years, treason is a calling card for high office in the U.S. government. Now we have treason laced all through the offices. Russia is not an enemy. Russia is a is a propped up concept to make an enemy in order to foment more wars and more will of military spending. And now anyone who was in contact with Russia is called a traitor. Well, that's kind of like 
CNN defining what fake news is. So we got everything pretty much upside down. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what Trump does for the first infrastructure plans, which require, back to your question, they require a suspension of the debt limit. Obama tried to set things up so he could shackle Trump immediately. But I don't think he set up this suspension lifting at a time when Trump was even a candidate. So kind of like kind of like Greenspan. Greenspan left a little bit early, remember? His tenure was not up. Right. And he, and he handpicked Bernanke at, so that he would not be there during the Lehman breakdown. You remember Robert Rubin retired uh, six months before the Clinton administration was done? He wanted to make sure that he wasn't there when the 2000 tech telecom bust was in full swing. And he also had a lot of private trading to do shorting the stock market. He raised the interest rates, then got out of town, profited personally after doing all the zero percent gold leasing, by the way. That's a Robert Rubin project. So, you know, these guys, they get out of Dodge before the failure happens on their watch. And that's pretty much what uh, Obama did. Uh, so, you know, I think we're going to get a suspension to answer your question. Continued expansion, raising the limit. When have we ever not done that? We've always done it. Right. You think we're not going to now? Well, you know, this could be a chance for the fascists, the neocons in Congress, who are probably 75%. Um, this is their chance maybe to say, you know, Trump, uh, you're the president, so, you know, deal with it. Here's the limit. We're not spending it. Deal with it. And then maybe we might get an executive order. <laughs> raise the limit. <laughs> oh, my goodness. The United States is so broken that I think it's going to be 10 years at least to begin fixing it. We started breaking in 71 when we lifted the gold standard. We had a climax of the breakdown in 2001 with the inside job 9-11 attacks and the Patriot Act, which I called the Fascist Manifesto, and we began the era of the fascist business model. How's it working out? Did we end up having more fraud or less fraud? More war or less war? More debt or less debt? More industry or less industry? And now we have a breakdown. Hey, I got news for you people. The United States is the center of the global fascist movement, and everything the fascists touch, they ruin, they kill their hosts. The U.S. is no different. Do you, do you think these fascists, do you think they're going to bring the economy down and blame it on Trump? Do you think this is one of their plans? Yeah, I think so. But it's, I mean, look, look what happened with Obama. Obama got a good deal of blame for what happened uh, with, with Bush, too. And it was kind of silly. I mean, come on. Uh, immediately you had uh, the after effects of, of Lehman and the Lehman event itself. Uh, you can't blame that on Obama. You blame it on Paulson. You blame it on the Bush team, the cabinet. You blame it on a lot of things, but not Obama. And now Obama has left the whole nation in absolute tatters. So... Trump gets elected to try to fix the tatters. You can't blame Trump for the tatters. He's there to fix the tatters. And, and he's going to have a very difficult time. I, I, I think he's going to be a one-term president, but I think he's going to start a lot of really positive things. Uh, he's made way too many enemies already. I mean, he declared war. Dave, I, I mean, we really need to get to the crux of what this is all about. Uh, Trump is the first America candidate. First America is a name of fired generals and admirals from the, the Pentagon. They were fired by Clinton, Bush II, and Obama. 500 of them because they were not loyal to the narcotics within Langley. Langley's been running the presidency since Papa Bush. 
1988. We've got almost 30 years of narco presidencies. Clinton, baby Bush, and Obama are all narcotics addicts. So it's very hard to reverse all this. And, and we, we have tremendous amount of destruction. So Trump ran on a plank to stop the destruction. And he's the first America generals have been meeting every year in Idaho. Remember at the inauguration speech, Trump mentioned first America something like a dozen times. America first, rather. America first. And it's a code word. It means we just had a Pentagon white hat military coup. The good guys in the Pentagon have taken the nation back. And Trump had an executive order to cut off the narcotics funds movement into the U.S. banks. He declared war against the black hats of Langley. This is war. We have civil war in the U.S. government at the highest level. Trump is trying to restore the nation and remove the narcotics from our highest offices. We have wars that are funded by narcotics. It's called ISIS. People, wake up. The Syrian war is funded by narcotics. The Yemen war is funded by Saudi narcotics in league with the Bush team. And a very funny little side story when it comes to narcotics. Remember Jeb Bush in the early portion of 2016 dropped out of the Republican presidential race? Yes. You remember his weepy, wimpy reason? You people are criticizing my mother. Really? That's precisely when the Russian military was cutting off the narco lines for the Bush-Saudi connection. And Jeb Bush lost funding for his presidential campaign that was coming from Saudi narcotics. So how far are the fascists going to take this? I mean, we can see what's happening in the corporate media right now where they're pushing their agenda and Trump is fighting back and pointing out certain things. And, you know, there's fake news things going all around and things like that. But how far is the fascist neocons going to take this? Uh, are, are they going to take it to the next level? And when I say that, I mean, maybe assassinating them if they don't get their way. I don't want to talk about the assassination concept okay. at all. Let me put it this way. When they talk about globalists, when Trump talks about the people versus the globalists, he's not really specific. What he's referring to is the global banker cabal. What he's talking about is the group of corporations, the sectors, like the banks, news media, uh, pharmaceuticals, and a few others with a more minor role, all being in league together, energy, oil and energy, being in league together toward establishment of the global fascist state. That's what I call it. Globalist means global fascist state. But if you look in the, in the, in the online uh, magazines and news sites, you hear the phrase New World Order. NWO. And, and that's one reason the Chinese under President Xi have very cleverly come up with the new Silk World Order. <laughs> In other words, the Eurasian trade zone is the answer to the new world order by the globalists who are promoting a global fascist state. Notice that in the European Union, orders are given by the commission, which is not elected like continuation of the Russian sanctions, even though almost no European nations wants them to be continued. So this is going to be motive to fracture the nation, the fracture of the nations within the EU. But how far are they going to take it? Here's the big, big point to make. If the economy gets ruined, or at the same time, one or the other or both, we have rioting in the streets of the United States, like, say, because they're out w without jobs, 
or because, say, the supply chain is messed up for gasoline and food, or, say, the various NGO groups funded by Soros, managed by Obama now, are inciting riots. If we have riots and civil disorder at the same time that we have economic uh, deterioration to the point of breakdown, then that is precisely what the globalists will use and take advantage of to create martial law under fascist rule. They will then say, we got emergency teams that must take over and Trump, you're not the president anymore. It would be a fascist takeover by, say, the narco barons in Langley. Will they take extreme measures against Trump? I don't know. I hope not. I don't want to repeat what I went through when I was 11 years old, which was the removal of John Kennedy, probably the last populist president we had. Don't think for a minute that Jimmy Carter was a populist president. No, he was part of the, the cabal. He continued everything that Kissinger had to do. He just had a different Secretary of State. By the way, if you're looking for the ringleader, the main organizers of the pedophile rings, there are two, Henry Kissinger and the Israeli Mossad. This is probably the biggest story since World War II. And it's just getting revealed one layer of the onion at a time. They invite congressional leaders or judges or bankers to Lolita Island in the Bahamas where Epstein does his, uh, you know, camping network. They film these people with underage girls or underage boys. I mean, just ask uh, Harry Reid. Harry, Harry Reid almost lost his eye at a gay sex party in the White House. I mean, you, you just can't, you can't approach Barack from behind when Michelle is watching because Michelle is Michael with a penis, okay? That's how Harry Reid almost lost his eye and he retired. Okay, we, we've got a lot of these leaders who are caught in the honey trap of pedophilia. And let me, let me just make a definition distinction. I don't really like the name pedophilia because if they kill uh, a 12-year-old girl after raping her several hundred times and they kill her on the, the Satanist altar... I don't call that pedophilia. I call it child sacrifice and murder on the Satanist altar. And so does Trump call it that. We've got a great deal of Satanist threads running through the U.S. government at the highest level. Why does Nancy Pelosi have a restaurant that's named Goathead something or other in California? You just do a little research. These people are all dirty. Not 100%, but a lot of the major leaders are dirty. And uh, Kissinger is a main leader in the extortion. And once they got a guy who, who you know, really likes Julie, and he came to learn late that she was a well-developed 16-year-old girl, he came to learn it late, it's all on video. They vote exactly as how they're told. This is how it happens. It's called honey traps. And it, it's not just used to control people in their favor. It's to control people who, who do things like Elliot Spitzer. Does anybody realize what Elliot Spitzer was on the verge of doing before he fell into the honey trap? He was going to prosecute Wall Street for insider trading in the multi-billions. But no, no, he had to back out. I was kind of hoping Trump would appoint, <laughs> would, would appoint Elliot Spitzer as his, as his uh, attorney general. But, you know, that's just wishful thinking. I mean, what could they do to Elliot Spitzer that they had not already done? What new vulnerability does he have? I, I, don't, I don't think he had any. Okay, so 
I think they're going to try to bring down the U.S. economy. And believe me, it would not be hard if they worked at it because they've been doing a passive breakdown for a long time. Now all they need to do is do an active breakdown like stop QE, stop the bond monetization for U.S. government bonds and for uh, mortgage bonds. And lately, I think the Fed is involved a little bit, not as much as the European Central Bank, but I think the Fed's involved to some extent now with corporate bonds. So they can just halt all that and we'll get a new layman of that under the Trump administration. So he'll go into not panic mode, but, you know, crisis alert war room mode. And I think all of his projects would be on hold. And we can continue the wars. Are we still going to have a, a reset of the dollar collapsing? Is that still in, in play right now? Well, you know, this is very weird and ironic. I made a call three years ago. I said the dollar is going to rise. We were not then at that point. The dollar was not rising. I said we're going to get to a point in the next couple of years where the dollar rises, rises, causes tremendous problems around the world economy, rises some more and then vanishes. I never use the word crash. We're going to see the dollar rise, rise, and vanish. Not crash. We may have some little sell-offs, but I think we're not done with the dollar rising. Because we're in a crack up boom. We got a treasury bond black hole. We got an asset bubble, the largest in the history of the financial world. It's called the treasury bonds. I mean, apart from housing, you know, housing was a fixed asset. This is a financial black hole. Financial. Uh, well, you know, we did have the, the mortgage, uh, the mortgage finance bubble. But the U.S. Treasury bond bubble is bigger than the mortgage side of the housing bubble. So we're going to see the dollar rise some more. And look at the damage. I mean, I, I have, you know, I have a viewpoint of the damage from this Latin America perspective. Very few people understand what, what's going on with Puerto Rico and, and Dominican Republic. Well, they're in trouble. They're in trouble because mainly their currency fell. And therefore, their debt became more difficult to manage. The Dominican peso is down 35 to 40 percent in the last two or three or four years. Well, you might say, well, big deal. How does that affect anything? Well, it affects the price of their food, affects the price of a lot of things. It increases the crime level in Dominica and works toward breakdown of their entire society. How do I know about that? Well, I know a couple of, of Latinas who are from Dominica. I shouldn't say from the Dominican Republic. Uh, RDOM, RD. They call it DR. We call it RD. Um, so, you know, when you talk about the dollar rising, you got to look at where the, where the damage is. It's with emerging market nations whose currencies are down 20, 30, 40 percent. That includes Brazil. Remember, these are the countries that the United States encouraged to borrow at the zero percent rate, which we called risk free. Not risk free. The big risk is with currency, not interest rate. I mean, if you have a 30 percent decline in your in your uh, currency, it's, it's as though you had a 20, 30 percent increase in your interest rate on the same loan. You got between nine and 15 trillion dollars of debt in emerging market nations that's going to be defaulted on. It's all in dollars. And I, I was asked the question, how, why is it between nine and 15 trillion? Don't they know? Well, yeah, they know. But how do you define an emerging market nation? OK, add a few more nations to the list and it moves from nine to 15 trillion. They're never going to pay it back. So the dollar is not going to crash, Dave. The dollar is going to endure a boycott. The West is going to continue with the dollar stubbornly with trade and banking. By trade and banking, I mean 
a load of goods comes in, whether it's oil or a container vessel, and it's paid for at for the trade, it's paid for in U.S. Treasury bills. And by banking, I mean, well, the banks in South Korea, the banks in France and Germany, Italy, they have their reserves denominated in dollars with U.S. Treasury bonds, the, the longer term. And right now they're realizing, gosh, we're not making any money on these reserves because of the zero percent. The, the Treasury bonds are, are way down, like that two percent, give or take. It's nowhere near justified for the risk. Okay, so the East, like Asia, the Eurasian trade zone, you know, with the center being Russia and China, and increasingly it will be Japan and Korea. We have the opposite ha happening. They, they have the non-dollar platforms uh, that are coming into view, like the Asian Infrastructure uh, Investment Bank, like the... Uh, cross-border interbank payment system, also called the Chinese Interbank Payment System, CIPS. That competes with SWIFT for global bank transactions. There are a number. There's the, uh, the BRICS uh, Global Bank. I think the BRICS Bank is going to be eventually serving a role whereby nations discard their treasury bonds deposit them at the BRICS bank, and in return are given gold bullion to put them into their banking system. And that's how they're going to rescue their bank system from the, the vanishing dollar. Now, the IMF has got its plan. They actually think they're going to have a, a gold-backed uh, SDR currency, which is the basket special drawing rights currency. It's the dollar, the euro, the British pound, and the yen. Add now the Chinese currency, the RMB, um, they actually think they're going to do a gold back basket with the IMF, and I think dream on, because when they announce any kind of plan, if they ever get to the point of announcing a plan, these globalists are going to say, we have the solution to the problem that they created themselves, we have the solution, and it's a gold back basket, and it has a feature that if you're a country like Bolivia and you want to participate in global trade, you need to deposit a big tranche of gold bullion in Basel, Switzerland, where we will be the global central bank for gold. And the East, with their Eurasian trade zone, probably will say, uh, not over our dead country's bodies. We're going to do the BRICS global bank for that role. So the West is going to try to centralize the gold-backed currency solution, while the East, under China's lead, are going to try to do a decentralized gold-backed currency and trade note. I think the first thing we're going to see in the next several months, potentially, is a gold trade note, uh, which will be a... Uh, a device, a vehicle to guarantee trade payment and trade delivery and not involve the dollar. For the last 30 years or more, 40 years has been the, the Treasury bill. I think we're going to be moving slowly. And we're, we're seeing the evidence now of, of the structural makeup for the gold trade note, Dave. And I'm, I'm very excited about this. Uh, take a look at how China and Russia... I'm going to morph here into a gold trade note discussion, if you don't mind. Take a look at how Russia sells China oil. They accept RMB currency, and then the, the, the Russians then go to Shanghai and convert into gold with the RMB-denominated gold futures contract in the Shanghai Gold Exchange. So... China pays with RMB for Russian oil, and the Russians buy gold in Shanghai with those RMB. Soon we're going to have an RMB-based oil contract in Shanghai. So it'll be one step less for the Russians. Now, also mix in with that thought. 
that the Chinese and Russia, Russians have a multi-billion, multi-year contract for building pipelines and LNG facilities, primarily pipelines for oil and gas. And the Chinese will pitch in treasury bonds. So they're dumping in what's called indirect exchange. Two parties using a third party currency to pay off a bill between the two parties. Indirect exchange. The Russians are using those treasury bonds <laughs> to keep their ruble strong or, you know, not from caving in. Uh, oh, my goodness. So we have the makings of the gold trade note using Russian and Chinese energy trade. Remember, the petrodollar is what replaced the gold standard in 1971. It took a couple of years, took till 1973. The petrodollar has a petroleum sale foundation based in dollars where OPEC led by the Saudis never converted their surplus into other currency. They left them in dollars. That was part of the deal. So the Saudis accumulated a tremendous amount of treasury bonds. And notice that in the tick reports for the, the treasury bond listings, for the longest time, the Saudis were not a single line item. It was OPEC nations. <laughs> That's to hide the fact that the, uh, the Saudis had a tremendous amount of treasury bonds, but also to hide the fact that the Saudis were required to supply the Department of Treasury with their core for the Exchange Stabilization Fund, which is an entirely separate topic. There was another slippery line item in the tick report for treasury bond listing, and that is the uh, Caribbean grouping, grouping. Uh, for quite a while, Bermuda and Cayman were not delineated separately. That's to hide the fact that the British were buying a tremendous amount of treasury bonds illicitly under the table. Who cares if it's illicit anymore? Law doesn't mean a damn thing to these fascists. They'll violate the law and, and say it's all for national security. They violate the law and, and, and create a new war and say war is good for the economy. Always need an enemy. I just hope that Iran is not painted as an enemy here in the next couple of years because uh, not going to work. Iran's got good friends with the Russians and Chinese. You attack Iran and you're basically attacking the, the big triangle of the old empires, Chinese empire, Russian empire, and Persian empire. Not going to work. Now, the U.S. is bankrupt. All we have left now is a military that's largely depleted. Hey, Jim, I wanted to go back to the gold trade note. What effect will that have on gold and uh, and silver? Will that increase the uh, value of gold and silver if countries are trading in the uh, gold trade note? If the gold trade note becomes a formalized item, you're going to see the shutdown very quickly of COMEX. You're going to see nation after nation fall on, climb on to this movement. And you're going to see the most gargantuan, formal, official demand <clears throat> in modern history for gold. <clears throat> you're also going to see it for silver because silver will be a monetary metal. I think the gains for silver will be at least double the gains for gold. When I asked the voice, this was a, a year ago, what, no, two years ago, what ratio do you recommend for precious metals investors, gold versus silver? I told him that I have been recommending 80% silver and 20% gold pretty much since the layman breakdown in 2008. And by the way, I got correct the forecast that we would move to 0% after layman. I also got correct that the 0% would remain in place forever. I also got correct that we would go to the QE bond monetization like a a third world nation monetizing our trillion dollar annual debt in the United States. I also got it right that QE would remain in place forever. So this is, uh, we're, we're going to see tremendous demand for gold and silver. It's going to happen on both the trade side and the banking side which will be a double-edged sword against the dollar and its global reserve currency status. 
I mean, if you were to ask 100 Americans picked at random, what does the global reserve status mean for the dollar? I think you get 98 blank stares and maybe one correct answer and one close to correct answer. What it means is that trade is settled internationally in the dollar. What it means is that the reserves, reserve assets for global banking systems, like in Korea, like in France, are based in the U.S. Treasury bond. So when gold goes after the trade payment route with the gold trade note, and when gold bullion goes after the bank reserve route, which is largely U.S. dollars through trade uh, through treasury bonds, you're going to see the dollar lose its global reserve currency status and the U.S. forced to create its domestic only currency, which I've given the name and I'm, I'm very happy to see other authors latch on to it. I call it the new Scheiss dollar because Scheiss is German for shit and excrement and, you know, rubbish, flotsam and jetsam. Scheiss is a little more general a word in German than just shit. In the United States, we, we don't call shit uh, rubbish in a vacant lot. They call that shites. It's, you know, it's waste, rubbish. Uh, so when the U.S. is forced to create its domestic-only currency, that's when the major, major crisis happens in the U.S. By that I mean that's when the currency crisis hits, and that's when the import prices double because we're going to have probably a sequence of devaluations. The, the Chinese, when when they were forced to endure uh, a default on the gold lease, I mean, there, there's so much to tell about recent history that's not told properly. When China got the 1999 Most Favored Nation status, they were asked to lease Wall Street a bunch of gold. I think it was something on the order of 3,000 or 5,000 tons. And the Chinese were very smart and they said, well, we want a guarantee on this. So we gave them a secured stream bond, like a mortgage, but the secure stream was income, ta income taxes from the United States um, population, the citizens, the economy. And when the recession slammed the U.S. in 2007 and 8, the Chinese began dumping their Fannie Mae bonds. And they also demanded, uh, what do you call it, asset seizure for things like uh, the J.P. Morgan headquarter property. I mean, how many Americans know that J.P. Morgan's headquarters is owned by the Chinese? Very, very few, under 5%, under 3%, maybe under 1%, because we're not a very well-informed nation, given that CNN is so popular. Okay, so a lot of things going on here, Dave, and the moving parts are, are very wicked, and uh, the, the Chinese are, are all over this. They infiltrated the International Monetary Fund. They're now making rules. Since when? Since when does Alibaba's CEO have a keynote speech at the Davos Switzerland Economic Forum, which is really not an economic forum, it's more like a banker barbecue. And I wouldn't be surprised if in the back room there's some pedophilia going on and some uh, murder of kill of children. I mean, I'm not crazy. It's all coming out. Yeah, there there have been arrests. Vault seven. There have been a thousand arrests in the United States, and the ma major media will not report it for pedophilia. And whenever you hear pedophilia, think child slavery and murder. Okay, so the Chinese are, they're making big strides. Uh, it's just happening slowly. But we're going to see a tremendous demand for gold and silver come when the U.S. loses its, its global reserve currency. Uh, it's not a birthright, it's just an exorbitant privilege as uh, the Justin, of, of the French leader, can't think of his first name. Uh, it was a hyphenated name. Anyway, Justin, president of France, used to call it the uh, the exorbitant privilege of the United States. So when the U.S. Here, here, here's where rubber meets the road with the dollar. When we have to come up with a new dollar for the United States economy alone, 
all foreign held dollars, I mean, all U.S. dollars outside the U.S. border, like Panama banks, Hong Kong banks, Swiss banks, London banks, all these banks, Singapore banks, all these banks holding dollars will no longer follow orders from Washington. It'll be the end of FATCA rules. It'll be the end of, of obstruction uh, for movements, for, you know, ridiculous rules. And everybody under the sun being accused of being a narco money launderer just because the volume's high. I mean, they're doing a lot of stupid things. So when the U.S. has to come up with its domestic only dollar, that's when you're going to start to see a lot of emphasis on the trade deficit. Because any nation that has its own currency just for usage in its own economy, in its own sphere, must abide by its fundamentals, like Venezuela is now. So the U.S. is going to have a sequence of devaluations. The Chinese, when they got reneged upon in 2006 or 7, they went about their various steps, but they told the U.S., you must come up with your own currency because you're ruining the international dollar. And we, we said, F you, we'll do as we damn well please. We're the leader of the free world. No, the leader of the fascist world. And what we've done since then was to impose 0% and not give them any interest on their reserves, another FU. And then we start printing money like Zimbabwe and certain South American countries have done. You can't print money, which is used as the global currency reserve and banking system. So the Chinese told the Americans, you need, with your new domestic-only dollar, to have a 50% devaluation. And the U.S. said, oh, really, that's, that's pretty painful. Would it be okay if we do 30% devaluations back-to-back? -back? Now, here's how devaluation mathematics works. Just focus on the retained value of, of, from a devaluation. Do a 30% devaluation, you retain 70%. So your buying power for $100 is like what it was for $70. Do another 30% and you retain 70% of what you had before. In other words, 49%. There's your 50% devaluation. Except I don't think it's going to end there because we're not going to get rid of our trade deficit. We don't have sufficient industry. That's why I think Trump is trying to focus first on the, on the infrastructure, second on the reindustrialization, and he wants to buy time before the world rejects and boycotts the dollar. In other words, let's reindustrialize the United States before we lose the global currency reserve. That, I think, is the main objective for Trump, apart from all the political backstabbing, sabotage, and illegal activity. So he's really planning for everything after the fact. He's saying, okay, I understand what's coming. I understand the dollar is going to be devalued. We're going to have a domestic dollar. The way of life, I mean, if you're talking about all these devaluations, it's going to be horrific for the people. And we're going to have to bring back manufacturing to, you know, actually restart the country. Exactly. We don't have adequate manufacturing to export from so that our inadequate manufacturing has resulted in a gargantuan trade deficit. Isn't the public going to be angry when, you know, all of a sudden their way of life completely changes? Well, yeah, but that feeds right into the hands of the globalists who are going to say, well, it's time for martial law and we're going to have, uh, we're going to have our fascists take over because Trump failed. Trump well, is going to try to get this done before we lose the dollar global reserve currency status. Trump wants to do some very clever things, Dave. He wants to, okay, let's just do some, some economics fundamental accounting. Um, I focus on the trade deficit because it's so big, it's $500 billion a year and growing. But what really counts is the current account deficit, which is the trade deficit plus any differential we have on financial trade, like um, the difference between 
Americans' purchase of foreign bonds and real estate versus foreigners buying bonds and real estate and commercial buildings. Okay, the financial transactions for bonds, real estate, uh, uh, just, just lots of things, property, commercial building, you, you name it. Okay, since QE came into, into, into phase, our financial balance of trade, trade payments has gone worse. We're doing QE for bond purchases because we have inadequate foreign purchases of our bonds while we have a growing trade deficit. So the current account deficit is actually growing and is worse than the, the trade deficit. Okay, what Trump wants to do, here's a very clever plan. If he can bring in, in one year, say $400 billion of Asian money for infrastructure projects, he can offset 80% of our $500 billion trade deficit. And if he does it again in the second year, he can offset again 80% of the trade deficit. Maybe it'll only be 60%, 65% in the second year because we will have created maybe 20, 30, 40, 50,000 businesses. And by the third year, maybe we'll have sufficient mass for the real industrialized base that we won't have a trade deficit that's very big. And then we can launch the new dollar and not have this currency crisis. That's the Trump plan. I don't know if he's going to be able to pull it off because the Japanese government just had a, uh, a, a ruling that you, they could not, the United States could not use a trillion in their pension, their government pension fund without some vote in their parliament. And remember, the U.S. doesn't care about law. They say, you're our vassal state, F you, do what we say or we'll start killing people. And now the Japanese are pondering the prospect of investing a trillion. They've got a few trillion in their pension funds. They've got, they're one of the richest nations in the world when it comes to pension funds. But most of them are private. So you see the point of going after the the government pension fund, because the U.S. government controls, as a vassal state, the Japanese government. And then you have the whole other issue of the Bank of Japan. They own a trillion dollars in treasury bonds. So maybe they'll participate also. Maybe it'll be $250 billion from the government pension fund and $250 billion from the Bank of Japan from their treasury bonds for the first year. There's lots of trillions to commandeer in Japan. Oh my. So we got, that's how Trump wants to try to deal with it. To use the current account deficit, make it a surplus and offset the trade deficit. Very clever plan. This is a business expert. What was Obama an expert in? He was an expert in acquiring cocaine bags. He was an expert in revealing sealed documents from the courts for his political rivals. He was an expert in finding a boyfriend and buying Michelle, Michael Robinson, Michael LaVon Robinson, and buying him for $25,000 from Reverend Wright at the church. That is what Obama was expert in. Trump's a businessman who knows how to recover from financial distress. He came back from bankruptcy at least two times. My concern about that is that he might have had to, you know, sell his soul a bit to the bankers. I don't know. We're going to find out. Will we have any progress at all on the financial front? Or will the dollar continue to be the most corrupt currency in modern history, fortified by the exchange stabilization fund. By the way, the Fed owns about, I think it's $4 trillion worth of treasury bonds. The question never asked is, how much does the U.S. Department of Treasury own? I think it's twice that. It's the exchange stabilization fund. When, when $400 billion worth of treasury bonds were dumped in the last year, 
the buying was not largely done by the Fed. It was largely done by the U.S. government and kept out of the news. The Department of Treasury is buying our own debt. So aren't the fascist neocons going to try to stop Trump from doing what you just said? Because, I mean, he'll look like a hero if he pulls this off. And I'm assuming they... Yeah, they'll probably, they'll try to interrupt anything he tries that will be, you know, worthwhile. The neocons don't do things that are constructive. I don't think you can find any one of their policies in the last, in the last two, the three presidential administrations that have been positive. You can say, oh, Clinton, look at all the prosperity we had during Clinton. No, what Clinton did was he stole Fort Knox and used all the profits from this, the dumping of Fort Knox to support the treasury bonds and lower the interest rates for businesses. And if you do some econometric analysis, you will find that the number one cost factor for American business was interest rate back then. So he improved the most important and vital cost item. Okay, what has Obama done? Obama created Obamacare, which pretty much decimated the small business sector and resulted in a complete halt of hiring. So, you know, the, the neocons don't do constructive things. No, they, they, they really don't. And, and you know what I'm seeing? You mentioned Iran with war, but I'm noticing a lot of propaganda and a lot of a, a huge push for North Korea. Uh, because the U.S. is moving the THAAD uh, missile system into South Korea. I heard there was a report that North Korea was firing their missile and they were trying to hit a Japanese base. We know there was that assassination in um, Malaysia. Now the Malaysian ambassador and the North Korean ambassador, they're both leaving each other's uh, country. To me, it seems like they're trying to you know, shift everything and trying to start something with North Korea and pushing very, very hard. I mean, do you see that? Well, yeah, these are the neocons. Yeah, they're, they're trying to become belligerent and, and bring about some kind of sparks between the U.S. and China. And it, it's just not going to work. It is not going to work. I mean, the Chinese have, have fired back, not missiles, but They've halted 110,000 tourists to certain locations in South Korea. They're not, they're not going there anymore. Yeah. I mean, the, the Chinese have a, a billion, a billion man army with commerce. They're boycotting Apple devices right now. They have been boycotting Google for the longest time. The, we, we've got conflict over the, the South China Sea continuing. I got a funny little side story. I might have told it in a previous interview with you, but it's quick. I got a, con a client in Hong Kong named Jerry. Jerry lives in an apartment building, a big one, kind of luxurious, nice, and he's got a doorman in front. It might not be all that luxurious to have a doorman. But anyway, he was just striking up a conversation with his doorman. This was two years ago. And he said to his doorman, you know, my son has got an interesting job now. He's been he's being paid by a U.S. government uh, agency with a, you know, with a, you know, a name that does not say U.S. government on it. But he's paid one hundred dollars a day to carry a placard and, and yell slogans about the Japanese objection to the South China Sea Islands. OK, so, you know, if you're wondering, is the United States behind the, the demonstrations? in Asia, in that region, regarding the South Sea Islands? The answer is yes. And I have a client whose son is, is, is being paid. They're doing the same business model with Obama and, Sir, and Soros. They're paid $14 an hour to go out and demonstrate against Trump. And the organizers, the, the managers, are paid a thousand dollars a month. So, what does Obama call these groups? Democracy, something or other. They're not about democracy. Nothing about the fascists is about democracy. I just saw a term. I, you know, I didn't know what it meant before. R I N O, Rhino, the Republican in name only. They're fascists. Well, we need a Dino too. Democrat in name only. They're fascists. Mm. We got Democrat neocons. Does anybody realize 
that the Obama Secretary of State and the pretty much the entire brass of their State Department was holdovers and other associated members of the Bush team. The neocons cut across both parties and the State Department is your best evidence. I mentioned that to my blockheaded brother. He said, oh, I didn't know that. I said, that's because you're reading the fucking New York Times. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts or anything else you want to uh, say? Sell all of your paper assets. Sell the majority of them. Get going. Because the Fed and the Wall Street banks are keeping your stocks propped. And they're pretty much the only buyers of bonds sell what they're propping. Ha has anybody ever heard the concept of sell high, buy low? It's kind of a foreign concept now because the Wall Street boys are trying to get you to believe buy high and as it keeps going higher, buy more. They're bubble merchants. So sell the stocks and bonds, sell your, your CDs, redeem them because they're at risk. If the new dollar is announced next month, I guarantee there's going to be a stock market decline. I guarantee there can be bank bail-ins and failures. What do you do after you sell all these paper assets? You buy gold and silver bars and coins. Buy all you can find. In fact, pay small premiums to buy what you can. Go into dealers and say, I know the price is X for gold coins, but I'll give you an extra 80 bucks per coin if you can just find them. I guarantee you go to the top of the list and there'll be more to buy. So we need to increase the premiums on these merchants in order to make it more apparent that the gold price is phony and so is the silver price. Okay. After you go buy your gold and silver, just sit back and, and watch because things are going to break down a lot worse. Uh, I'd like to end with one little quick story. The Voice had a story to tell back in... In uh, right around Christmas time, a couple months ago, uh, it was about what is the real price of gold? And one of my questions to him was, have you, do you have any recent transactions that you've heard of that are, you know, large quantity where the price of gold was known? And he wrote back and sent a picture. And I'm, I'm not permitted to, to reveal certain details, but it was a... It was a, a bin loaded with something on the order of a hundred million dollars worth of gold. And the price was two thousand one hundred dollars per ounce of gold. So I don't give a rat's ass, Dave, what the COMEX price is. I care <clears throat> what the large volume purchases are for because that is precisely where the equilibrium lies. Okay. Big purchases, big demand, proper price paid in order to have the owners and holders of large supplies give them up. I think what we have with the dealer shops is a fake price. All you have to do to prove it's a fake price is go to your dealer and say, I want to buy a few gold coins. What do you have? What do you have for, you know, recent mintage? I don't care about a 100-year-old gold coin. I care about a gold coin that's after the year 2000. Ask him what he has, and you'll probably hear, well, we, we've got about, you know, can't say exactly, but how many do you want to buy? And if you say, I want to buy a dozen, he might say, well, we got that, or we can make sure we can fill that in a couple days. Then you say to him, I got a driver out back with two armed guards, and we've got several million dollars worth can you can you possibly buy a couple thousand is it possible to buy a couple thousand gold coins that's when you get the interesting responses no no we don't have that you kidding you crazy well why wouldn't you be able to get that if that's the proper price if it's the equilibrium then you should be able to to attract the supply with that price and it's not the price so I don't care what the COMEX price is. I, I rarely look at it, but recently I've been looking at the graphs to see if we have some, some reversals in progress. And we have a short-term silver price reversal. We do not have a gold short-term price reversal, not yet. We've got serious overhead between 1300 and 1350 
But uh, I think silver's going to make the move first and, and drag along gold. And that, it's kind of backwards, but that's the way it is because uh, the silver deficit is so much worse than gold. It's an enormous deficit for silver. This enormous, tremendous, this tremendous industrial demand for silver. You got irreplaceable uh, applications. And, you know, we, we do hear things like, well, as far as solar panels go, there is some replacement. They're not all now silver. Well, that, that's true, but the great majority still are. And don't buy the argument about digital cameras are going <laughs> to remove the demand for silver. That's so stupid. <clears throat> Yeah, try try taking a look at emerging market nations and Latin American nations, and let me know if they're still printing uh, photographs. Uh, the answer is hell yes. So there is more digital camera, but gosh, you know, some of the more recent applications of, of, of silver are in uh, pressure-treated lumber. I remember when I was building back porches and stuff like that, I did a couple. I mean, I've done some kitchens and bathrooms uh, and back porches, and the back porches were the most fun. Because uh, you start from nothing. Uh, we, we put in some pressure-treated lumber for what touched the ground. You don't want the rot. You don't want the uh, insects. Well, now the, the pressure-treated lumber uses a silver uh, compound and doesn't use that arsenic green compound. Uh, arsenic is not a good thing to put into your lawn. <clears throat> arsenic doesn't really favor the growth of grass. But silver doesn't bother anything. So, you know, we've got all these applications, and uh, I asked the voice, <clears throat> if the premium for gold is like 70 80%, what's the premium for silver? And he said, oh, at least that. I said, do you have actual transactions that you could point to? And he said, well, I, I remember a few recently, but I don't have data and a picture like I do for this one. And this, this sale, this purchase, at $2,100 was in Dubai. And I said, is this a Chinese buyer? And he said, well, it's Asian. And I said, where's the origin of this? Is it from stolen recast Swiss refinery gold? And he said, no, I can't say. We're in very interesting times here, and Trump has only elevated the risk level. One thing the bankers don't want to see is rioting on the streets where they go after the bankers. So they're going to work this in such a way as the scapegoats are targeted. And uh, that's where you get the, the, the real dumbasses in the crowd who, who think that China and Russia are adversaries. Now, the adversaries are living in the castles of Europe and London. Those are the adversaries. The adversaries are the Bush family. When I saw Papa Bush uh, for the introduction of the Super Bowl, I had to leave the room because I didn't want to vomit on my table. <clears throat> this is a man involved in the global fascist movement, in the narcotics. He's personally worth at least $5 trillion from heroin and cocaine. He's responsible for executing the Rothschild plan for 311 in Japan called Fukushima. That was a contractor project. Those were mini nukes. And the signatures for all the seismic movement pointed to an explosion. It was not natural, detonation in other words, followed by an explosion that was made to look natural with seismic waves. So the detonation of micronukes followed by the harp weapon used to create the earthquake and the tsunami. So why would they do that? Because Japan announced that they were going to be working with closely with China in a global current, a, a global, I'm sorry, work with China, Japan to work with China in a regional gold backed currency for trade and banking. In other words, the Japanese violated their vassal slave status. Oh, man. So you got to get prepared. Uh, I'm very curious about the, uh, the bail-ins. People ask me, what will it take for the, the, the great bulk of the American society to wake up to what's going on? And my answer is twofold. 
shortages of gasoline and food, and theft of their bank accounts through bail-ins. Unless and until those happen, I just don't think they're going to wake up. Because right now they're, they're, they're busy, you know, rioting over Trump. Uh, gosh, there was a nasty incident in San Francisco, and I think it was Haight-Ashbury area, Berkeley area. Uh, a bunch of Trump supporters were actually beaten up. And, you know, it's, it's funny. The fascists have now signed in. The Marxist types, you know, you take a look at Hate Ashbury. They're not about fascism. They're about Marxism. They're about socialism. So I give credit to the neocons. They had a Marxist president called Obama, and they roped in the Marxists to join the fascists. Very well done. And they all are opposed by the populists. So, going to be some interesting times, Dave, and yes. thanks for having me on. And th these are not going to be calm, placid times. They're going to be very rocky, and your insurance will be gold and silver, not your stock account, not your bond account. Hey, Jim, I, I appreciate you being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Thanks for all this great information. Once again, how can people get your newsletter and see your work? If you go to www.goldenjackass.com, you'll see a free page. It's called Main 5. It just means it's the fifth version of the main page. I'm trying to get it right. Uh, the main page, the, the free page, it's in public domain. It, it has a lot of interviews like this. It has uh, numerous public articles. Um, I try to come out with one a month. I, I have a few different interviews per month. It's, they're more fun. Uh, and I think people appreciate the interview more than they do a public article. They, they latch on to it better. But the, the website is to promote the Hattrick Letter. That's the paid newsletter. Um, this May will be 13 years for the newsletter. And I'm, I'm very pleased with the progress for the newsletter. I'm very pleased with the, uh, the publicity that it gets, um, how elements are quoted. And I'm very, very uh, amused by how the new shice dollar term has been adopted by numerous writers out there. I haven't seen it in the Wall Street Journal yet, though. <laughs> or Barron's, but probably never will. So, I invite people to go to the, the website, look at the free material, and then sign up for the Hattrick Letter. There are two monthly reports. One is called the Global Money War Report, high-level issues. The second is called the, the Gold and Currency Report. Uh, I put in that one uh, the issues regarding the petrodollar, because that's related to currency, and also the Eurasian trade zone coming into view, the One Belt, One Road. Uh, which is really the non-maritime routes to capture Europe uh, in trade. So the two reports are monthly. Uh, they're a lot of work, Dave, and there's some stress when I'm doing the work because got to get things right. And I can't just go putting out stuff that I hear because sometimes things that I hear and read are not quite true or they're more like wishful thinking of well-meaning people. And mm -hmm. I, I could name names, but I'd rather not. Uh, I, 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 I actually contradicted a few well-meaning people in the previous years who thought we were going to get an explosion of, of price inflation in the United States. And uh, I mean, like in the official figure. And I said, no, we'll just get it in reality. We won't get it in the official figure. And then other people think we're going to get a breakdown of the COMEX that last year. And I, I didn't, I thought that we might by the end of the year see evidence of that, see it begin, but everything gets delayed. You know, if you're wondering what is the, one of the biggest delays that we've had in recent years of, of something planned, it was the global currency reset planned for January of 2014 that was interrupted by the, the U.S. State Department and the Israeli Mossad organized plan for a coup in Ukraine. That's right, the Ukrainian war. Ukraine war with the coup in the Maidan. That's, the, that's their big square, the Maidan square. The coup in Ukraine was to interrupt the 
global currency reset where the dollar was going to go away. So once again, war saved the dollar. And it's not portrayed that way in the news. We don't have much news these days, Dave, I, as I'm quite sure you agree. Completely agree with you, Jim. All right. Thank you very much for being on the spotlight. I really do appreciate it. Thanks a lot.